we can move on to questions because I think I'll, I'm out of to, I'm out of time by one minute. Hold. Uh, that's fine. Thank you so much, Zola. That was, uh, that was nice. Now I'm ashamed to say that I I I spent uh, I spent some what uh, close to four or five years in the same lab as Zola, and I I guess I never had the time to actually fully soak in um, the the sort of the sort of work that Zola does together with with uh, Professor Keith. But anyways. Uh, a lot of interesting things mentioned. Uh, I should mention upfront that I had extended an invitation to some some people that are somewhat experts in languages, just because I thought uh, they would pick up on one or two things. Uh, but unfortunately, they couldn't make it here. Uh, before I invite questions, though, I, I think maybe it might be important, Zola, for you to maybe clarify on what you mean by low resource or less resource. People might have uh, or they might misrepresent that phrase. I think it's important, uh, and then we can take in or we can take on questions. Thank you. Yeah, um, so uh, that's unfortunately, while that's like a simple question, that is a very, very difficult question because um, part of it has to do with the official metric one uses, right? So in South Africa, we had, I think a couple of years ago, many sure people know this, there was, uh, I forgot which country now in Europe, I think it was Sweden, they had an audit of the available human language technologies that they had like for the various languages that like spoken in the country. And so anyway, thing happened twice in South Africa now. And pretty much what was shown is that if you were to look at the numbers of resources that are available for these languages and compare them with say other like with European languages, there is a especially English, by the way. But the thing is, while English is a large gap, right, then that's pretty much true for every language. But even if you were to compare them with languages like German or France, or French rather, there is a very large gap in between the numbers of the tools that are available. So this is not just corporate, right? These are things like morphological analyzers, part of speech takers, et cetera, et cetera. That gap. Now, if the question is, uh, if the question should be asked here is, what is this number that a language needs to differ by in order to be considered like uh, less resource? Unfortunately, as far as I understand, there is no such number. It's just that like, if there's a large gap and whatever large means here is, depends on people, people I guess is, that's what it's considered as less resourced, at least by my standard. Yeah, and, and, and sadly, I think very few people actually get to appreciate that. Uh, so we come from a part of the world where for decades now, we've just decided to adopt English as like the language of instruction. So all documents are essentially written in English, right? Uh, but the case for South Africa is different for people in the room. The case for South Africa is different because uh, I think last time I checked, they had a total of, is it, 11 official languages, is it 11? Yeah. Um, we might reach here. Yeah, so, we do so have that, 11 that official languages, world. but again, even with that though, I do want to warn you that is, while the state says there are 11 official languages, right? And then generally speaking, and then much more generally, there are 25 languages which it claims that it will foster and support, right? Again, we don't, we're not a rich country, right? So it can only support languages as far as money can stretch, right? So if money is not available, then certain things have to, like generally speaking, right? So if something ever happens that there's money that's lacking, so certain things just fall by the wayside. So for instance, what I mean by this is, we had centers here that were responsible for, it, they were pretty much called like a coordinated, right? They were called the National Lexicographic Union. So they were pretty much for building like a lexicon of the language, building dictionaries, that sort of thing. But they tend to not be as active because they are not getting money at the same level, especially now. So it's not as if like we are any different. By law, technically speaking, maybe we are different, but by practice, unfortunately, because of constraints, we may pretty much be the same as Zambia. Hello. All right. Uh, questions, people. Zola is uh, uh, available for questions. Yeah. Um, don't be scared. Ask anything. <laughs> I think we have extremely smart people in the room here, so I, I don't think they'll be scared. But are there any questions? <laughs> Uh, yes, doc. Uh, hi, uh, Zoda. Hi, hi, Nos. Hi, okay, thank you. Uh, unfortunately, I joined in a bit late, I think towards the end of the session. So if I ask something you talked about, please bear with me. Um, just a quick question. The, the technology in your, your research, would I be right to say it's, um, 
in the same line like text mining and uh, that thing where you use bag of weights um, um, algorithm or something like that. Ah, okay, thank you. So, well, it's a sort of, um, it's not a, essentially what, what I'm talking about now is something called verbalization. So the main point of it, right, is to take in a, essentially the word was, the first time it was used, right, it was mostly used by people who were talking about the translation of axioms, like from whatever language you're using to represent your ontology to text. That's what verbalization is. Now, this has somewhat changed loosely, right, because again, some people now also use the same term to refer to the manner in which people, like the process of taking like a math, ex math expression and then generating a text and then like an explanation of what the math is. Now, within that process, right, nothing is stopping one from using text mining in any other process for that matter. For so long as it helps you in this idea of taking the formal representation and actually getting natural language text. So if you, there was a slide where I talked about what NLG is, right? So let me just quickly share my screen. Okay. Can you see it? Yes, yes. Yeah, so essentially yeah. what the field is doing, right, it's trying to combine methods from uh, artificial intelligence and computational linguistics. So text mining is not as if it's something you should not do. You can if you want to. But the main point here is to take generate these understandable texts from non-linguistic, sorry, from representations that are not linguistic in nature. Okay. It's not the main point, but one can do it, essentially. Oh, okay. Okay, okay. all right, thanks. Okay. Uh, more questions, people? <clears throat> now, I, I wonder if uh, we should have circulated the paper before this. Now. I'm wondering why. I, I can see Richard there, uh, I see Machaka, Brian. Do you guys have any questions uh, for Zola? No, okay. Simple questions from me, Zola. Uh, in terms of the different approaches that you highlighted at the beginning, you know, the the handcrafting approach, the statistical methods, and and the the neural approach, um, have you got into a stage where you've been able to sort of like compare what you're proposing to to these to these approaches, and, and and are you able to share the, I guess, the relative efficacy when when your approach is compared with what already exists? Is there yeah. something um, unique with what you are proposing? What you propose? So again, part of the issue come when it comes down to it, it has to do with the issue, right? The problem is not so much that the you one can do it right, but you're getting terrible results. The issue is that lack of data. And unfortunately, in order to get data, it would mean that one would have to invest a lot of money trying to get the specific data within a domain. So let me show you an example of what I mean by this. So for if one wanted to use statistical methods, right? Perhaps that's easier because one then there's a an approach that I think is very old now. So what people do is they build like a, a small hand-coded grammar and then you also do use the corpus to train like a, a re-ranker, like a statist statistical re-ranker. Then you generate text, candidate text, and then you rank them based on the on the your re-ranker, right? So that could be possible. The, the question, however, is that where do you text, get text in a domain, in a specific domain? So if you get text, for instance, um, so I'm not sure if I did mention this, but I probably should have. So one of the things I did for my master's degree was building grammars for Isizul when it's closer, right, within the context of weather generation. And it took me three months to get English data about South Africa. Now, can you imagine now, and the best I could do was to only translate that data from English to Isizul, but then the problem there is that that only also carries its own issues. So it is impossible to get the data in the first place. Maybe people in the future might want to invest money in actually building data sets. But unfortunately, well, I would don't it have... Not, would, it, would it not be possible to get the data from a piece of text that is available throughout the, the Holy Bible, right? And was that, uh, was that not sufficient? And the, 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 if you think about it, right, so generation, if you, if you just think about it, what it essentially is doing is... How would I put this? I'm going to try to use the template to explain what I mean by this. So if you are generating text, right, and even if you're using, say, neural methods, I think the key to it, at least in my view, is if you can find things that look like templates from that data, 
then that's the point. And then you can use that model pretty much captures those template-like structures and then it generates them. But the thing is, the Bible is very varied. It's not as if like you, they use the same sentences to talk about specific things. So in a domain where there's a little variety, vari oh, I hate this word, variety, it's quite difficult, unfortunately. So tech, like the Bibles are not gonna be useful. But more than that though is, um, so that's one part of it. It's just the difficulty of doing that. But then we have to think about it is that like the point of building NLG systems is to actually for them to be useful. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't see how people would actually use uh, an NLG system that generates Bibles. Like what use would that be to people? Because the point is to, like, in other words, the point is to present data in linguistic form. So there is no data in the sense of a Bible to present in the first place. Right, right. Interesting stuff. Any questions, people? Uh, Oh, so if I'm curious, right? Um, so at the beginning of your talk, uh, you, you, no. had, you had so that I reading. Think... Oh, there's a question from Knox. No, it's um, Maya Machaka Banda, I think. Uh, oh, he's saying no question, sorry. I thought you were saying he has a question. Oh, OK. Sorry. Yes. All right. Well, so I was, I was going to say, Zola, at the beginning of your talk, you had that really nice map where you said the, the focus for most of what you're doing is the cluster N. I think it was labeled N. To, to what extent yes. are we able to to sort of like extend what you're doing so that it, it includes, let's say if, if somebody from this part of the world was interested in extending your work, how much work would, would have to be put into that? I mean, how much how much modifications would would people have to do for them to, to sort of like reuse it in a completely different context? Let's say languages that fall within a different yeah. uh, so cluster. Yeah, that's an interesting question, by the way, but and it's part of like my thesis, unfortunately, I don't want to reveal too much, you, you will see sometime soon. But essentially, it has to do okay. with one of the things, the differences between my work and what a couple, like uh, some work uh, people, sorry, that were published last year. So I'm not sure people might not know her. There's a colleague of mine, John Perry Magusha, who wrote a thesis about verbalization within the context of healthcare. So she was interested in generating prescriptions. And in particular, she was generating prescriptions for Runyangora, but she also showed using, she developed a metric to measure the, how difficult it would be to bootstrap the approaches for Runyangora for to other languages like Isikos, uh, to Shona in Zimbabwe, and all other languages. So my approach pretty much for the most part, I'm also orienting my approach in that sense that I'm interested in this idea of bootstrapping and quantifying how much work do you need to do to be able to do this right? But again, I don't want to reveal much now because I haven't really published that, so I don't want my ideas to be stolen here. Yeah, sure, of course. Uh, <laughs> right, that is true. But you're almost done, though, so I, I don't think anyone will be able to steal that. Uh, uh, there's a question from Mumbia. Has a question, Mumbia. Welcome to ask, please. All right, thank you very much, Doc. Um, good, after, good evening, Zola. Hi, hi. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm okay. Yes, uh, I just wanted to know. I've got two questions. The first one is uh, when you are talking about data, like so. What kind of data do you need? Is it like in form of sentences or maybe it's translation of words? Because you are saying in the Bible, there are, there's no necessary information that you have. So is it like there are already constructed sentences that you need to work with, or maybe you just need translations of the words? And then the second question I have is, say when you are translating text, one thing I've noticed is that maybe uh, when you translate to another language, for example, you, you make a, a sentence and then translating to another language, the words are not placed the way, like if you translate the words, they're not placed the way they were in that language. I'll give an example, say, of Japanese. Yeah, I watch a lot of anime and uh, when it's subbed, you find that the way the words were arranged when translated to English, maybe they will start with a word that was spoken in the middle, it's placed in between. So. How do you get to rearrange those words? I would have given an example in Bemba, but you can't speak Bemba. So how do you do that? So those are my two questions. OK, thank you. Those are two wonderful questions. So I'll start with the second one. The, the second issue you write is, is a very interesting observation. I think, I think people in machine learning already talked about this quite a lot, right? I think they know this. The issue I have is that I want to be clear here is I'm not working on translation, right? Well, at least in the sense that I'm working from language to language. You can think about it as translation from data to language, right? So in other words, 
if the input itself is a numerical data with labels in it, right? So it has it could be something like say mean value, max value, blah 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 blah, that sort of thing. Then that thing does not have order in the sense where in, like, there's no word order because there are no words in that sense. So it doesn't really matter. But even if it did, um, translation within control languages is possible. I'm not sure if you know something called grammatical framework. I'll just post it here quickly. Um, um, okay, I'll post it in the chat. But if you're interested in working with uh, building small applications for translation, by the way, in, but that worries you, you should probably look into grammat grammatical framework, right? It's very nice because it limits the language itself. That is, you are not generating uh, you're not building a system that can translate any kind of sentence within the language. You can trans translate rather specific kinds of sentences. So that's how you deal with that thing, generally speaking, in translation. Uh, in machine learning, especially data-driven approaches, I don't know how they deal with that, to be honest with you. That's not my area. And then with respect to the second question of what data, what kind of data do you need, um, it kind of relates to what I just said now is data just means, in the case of NLG, right, the input data is anything that is not linguistic in nature. So it could be numerical data with labels with it if you want, but it could also be like something like OWL, that is that thing that looks like I just showed you before, that looks like a programming language. But then it could be, I, I don't know, it could be a picture if you want to, if you, like, nothing's stopping you from making a picture being the input. So the output on the other hand is text. Now the question you are like, I think that's much more interesting here is where do you get the text in the first place? So generally there are two, there are multiple approaches people use, right? The first one I think is you can look for a domain that already has text that exists. And then you try to learn how people frame, uh, speak about things within that domain. The problem is that a lot of the time, especially in my case, you have to work in cases where you don't have data like the final text. So for instance, if you want to generate the weather forecast in say Bamba, if people don't already write or perhaps uh, reports in Bamba, it means that you cannot get such data. So you need to speak to a linguist or a, with an expert at the same time. Oh, sorry, there's someone at the door quickly. I'm just gonna quickly run, come back. Hello? Yep. Ah, sorry. Uh, sorry about that. I was saying, so essentially, uh, I was talking about uh, the kind of data. So when there is no existing site or, or source of corpora, you have to speak with an expert. So the expert here could be the domain expert. That is, if you're talking about weather data, you need to sit down with the meteorologist or even the person who's responsible for communication as to if you have this type of information, how would you communicate it? And then you design templates if you must. And then that's very important here because if you do not have a lot of data, it means that you cannot use some of these methods. That is, these large deep learning approaches are not going to work when you don't have data. Even with the statistical methods for the most part, they're not going to work. I hope that answers you. Uh, yes, it does. Thank you very much. <clears throat> All right. Uh, looking at the time, uh, we'll, we'll accept one more question. If people have questions. All right, so I have shared the paper, right? You, the CSC 57 for one students, you probably want to read that, uh, that paper. Really exciting, interesting things. Hopefully this gives you an idea of what uh, sort of interesting work people elsewhere are doing, right? So there's, there's a lot going on out there. Um, great, so just to mention in closing here, if you happen to be interested in languages, I uh, wanted to mention that we happen to have a number of linguists at Windsor, right? A lot of people that specialize in languages like Bemba and, you know, Lozi and what. So if you're interested in this area, um, help is available, right? Now, I'm not sure if there's, there's anyone in the CS department who, who does research around languages, but I do know that there's a George uh, Mufungu, I think. Uh, he's based at the Copper Belt University. He does a bit of research aligned with languages, although his focus is mostly on um, speech recognition. So I guess what I'm trying to say is if you happen to have an interest in this area, there are people available that are willing to help, both at UNSA and, of course, I mean, people like Zola will probably be more than happy to chat with you offline. In fact, it turns out that it's one of the reasons why we're inviting these people, so that in the event that you develop an interest in an area, you can easily reach out to them, right? Um, 
Great. So with that being said, Zola, thank you so much. Really appreciate this. Always a pleasure. Um, I, I'm tempted to, I was tempted to extend an invitation to John as well, but I, I would have to find out if, uh, if people are interested in languages. If they are, then we'll try and see if we can squeeze in John to have her come and give her talk so that people can draw comparisons between what you're doing and what John, John focused on. If not, then probably we'll do it as a paper reading session or something. Uh, or a paper reading assignment. Yeah. Uh, thank so, you very much for the invitation. Yeah, uh, and then finally, there's a talk next week by Knox, like I said, I think Knox is in the house here, so please join us next week. And uh, thank you so much for, for coming through, that's the participants. Uh, we hope to see you next week. <laughs>